Well, hello, everybody, and hello to a lot of you that I already know. Um, I, was, I attended the EPOG Italian classes with the Torino group, so I already know a bunch of friendly faces and then some people from Rethinking Land, so this is nice. Uh, as David said, uh, I'm a former EPOG person, so I was in the second cohort, uh, and we, I don't know, we had one lecture in this room, but back at this building, so it's exciting to be back. Um, yeah, and so what am, I, what am I talking about today? The seminar name that was online was like kind of long and, long and messy, but I've actually been working on a different paper and a different kind of stream of thought that's a little more, a little more simplified and I think broader. So heterodox economics, um, which is something that I think a lot of you are familiar with, uh, and for the rest of you, we'll talk more about that. Uh, what does heterodox economics have to say about climate economy modeling? Um, so. The presentation will unpack those, those two different parts. I recognize that I'm standing right in front of the slides. I don't really know the solution to that, but yeah, so just kind of like wave your arms and yell at me if I'm in the way. Uh, and then if I speak too quickly, please wave your arms and yell at me. Uh, the Italians have yelled at me. The French did not yell at me yesterday, so I, I did okay, but, but. Yeah, the, or the Texas accent. That's, uh, if you want the Texas accent, I can do that later. Um, so let's see. Is that? Yep, I have a little clicker. So plan for the presentation. I guess the first thing to say is that we're actually going to break the joint seminar into two different pieces. So we're going to have a little over an hour that is the more formal presentation, then the discussants, and then question and answers. Um, then we're going to stop and do an activity where we actually try to get some hands-on climate economy modeling. So pay attention because there will be a quiz um, and we'll actually get to try to play with this a little bit. So that should be fun. Uh, so, but for the presentation itself, I'm gonna start with a quick introduction to heterodox economics because this was something that was requested. Um, and I know from my EPOG experience that a third of you are absolute experts on this and are going to be very bored. A third of you will recognize everything but not really know all about it. And a third of you have never heard of any of this stuff. And so it's just good to catch everyone up and, and sort of be on the same page. Um, then we're gonna talk about climate economy models, which I believe very few of you have probably played with because they're, they're quite new. And if you haven't like spent a lot of time trying to learn them, why would you know about them? Uh, and then uh, I'll talk about some of the places where I think heterodox economics and climate modeling can overlap. And really where can we as this pluralist or, or heterodox community make a contribution to this specific type of modeling um, and more broadly, climate change prevention. Um, so, a quick introduction to heterodox economics. Uh, so it's been a pretty hard year, or a hard decade for orthodox economics ideas. Uh, so starting in 2008 when the world economy collapsed, but then also following into the Eurozone crisis, various crises in the developing world, and then of course climate change uh, and the broader ecological catastrophe. Um, not to even mention the COVID crisis, which I think has shown a lot of, a lot of flaws in, in blind spots in what standard economics has difficulties dealing with. Things like supply chain issues, which is, is the big thing these days. Um, but luckily there, there ha are other ideas out there uh, and there is this field of heterodox economics. So again, I'm sure lots of you would love to debate exactly what it, we mean by heterodox economics, but for this presentation, I'm more or less just sticking with anything that isn't orthodox economics, anything that isn't standard neoclassical economics. Um, and so we've had lots of more uh, searches and publications about heterodox economics, and there seems to be a real interest both from students and young people, but also politicians and policymakers in the public. So things like modern monetary theory are actually being talked about by US Congress people, which, wow, what a world we're in compared to 10 years ago. Um, my clicker has stopped. Um, so just to, to start off the presentation, I just wanted to give a quick introduction to nine big ideas in heterodox economics. Uh, I think when we usually talk about heterodox economics, we talk about schools of thought. So I was trying to think, what am I? Uh, and I'm an old institutionalist with Kalecki in training, working with Shroffians on ecological macroeconomics, which about four or five of you might have understood. Um, but why should anyone outside of this room know what that means? Uh, so I think it's useful to stop and look at what are the actual ideas? What are the actual things that we're, we're debating and talking about? 
Uh, so I have four different topics, growth, money, work, and the big picture. Again, this is sort of just a very broad overview, but I think it's, it's helpful to, to say, what is this thing, this community that by being an EPOG, you're now at least adjacent to, if not fully a member of. Um, my clicker is, is dying on me, but so starting with growth, uh, the first of the, the big ideas that, that I think is really central to almost all heterodox strands is that the economy is almost always operating under its full capacity. So within neoclassical economics, uh, there's, there's an assumption that in the long run, the amount of productive capacity of the economy is set by the supply side. How many machines do you have? What kind of technology do you have? How many workers do you have? Uh, and demand, sure, it can have little bumps for ups and downs in the short run, but in the long run, it doesn't matter. Um, heterodox economics, and particularly Keynesian economics, does not agree with this and believes that in the long run, you really can have big demand effects. Um, and I'll come back to that later because it's quite central to what I'm doing with, with climate modeling. Um, another one is that systems of innovation drive long-term growth. Uh, there's there's a, a nice tendency in, in neoclassical economics to just assume technology, um, and specifically to assume 2% technology every year. Um, but really, there's a lot more to that in terms of both the direction of where the technology is going and the speed at which it's created. And so there's a whole world in research on, on the systems of innovation, the different ways in which um, yeah, the ways in which uh, productivity growth can happen. Um, and the option A people should know lots of things about that by now. Um, money, this is another one that the heterodoxy has a lot of ideas about. So on one hand, there's the idea that banks can create virtually unlimited amounts of money and it can be a really big problem. So this is the endogenous money theory, um, again from, from post-Keynesian land, but also more broadly accepted in the heterodoxy, um, which, which says that Yes, the central banks have some role in determining how much money there is, but also private banks, by making loans, are able to affect the money supply. Um, and that can be a problem because it means the money supply is determined by how banks are feeling. Uh, if they're very excited and they want to make lots of loans, you can have a huge explosion in the money supply. But if they're feeling very scared and want to take away all of the, the loans, then you can have a contraction. Um, and that's something that, that policymakers need to deal with. But on the other hand, there's the idea that governments can create virtually unlimited amounts of money. Uh, and in some situations, it could be the solution. Um, so of course, this is sort of the modern monetary world, but also in more broadly in post-Keynesian and heterodox economics, there's an idea that the, the limit placed on economies is not based on the amount of money in the economy, but other things like the productive capacity or balance of payment constraints. Um, and so you can think in more clever or creative ways about what, what governments can do with their power to create money. Um, work, there's lots of fun things about, about work that, that the, um, the heterodoxy has to talk about. So at a very basic level, that ownership and power shape the economy. Um, so this is obviously one of the main contributions from the Marxist economists, uh, but there's also a lot of other, other streams or strands that, that tie into this. Um, and, and sort of, it's one of those things that sounds very non-controversial. Of course, power matters, like we're economists, we should know that. But if you actually try to put it into a formal model uh, in a neoclassical framework, it's not so easy. Where are the unions? Where's the bargaining? Um, where is the fact that I need to work uh, to survive? It, it, it's hard to represent that. Um, Six, which is one of my favorites, that working with people is different than working with machines. Uh, so this is one of the big contributions from feminist economics um, and really trying to understand both how the service industry is very different from manufacturing uh, and how moving to a service economy is very different from, from the world that we created economics to explain in the 1800s, um, but also thinking about specific types of work like care work um, and how that, how that, work, how that is um, not just accounted for, but how that plays a bigger part in the economy. Um, things like social reproduction uh, is very important there. And again, that's sort of a, a broad belief throughout the heterodoxy. Um, and then seven, uh, that economies function better when people are involved in decision making. Um, so I think this one's quite fun because on one side, it's something that you could see from cooperative economics or, or even some strands of Marxism, um, that you would want workers to be in charge at the local level, or at least to have some democratic uh, processes to be able to control their working day and their working hours. Um, and then at a broader level that you want to have some role for the citizenry and, and for citizens 
to uh, control economic production. Um, but on the other hand, the Austrian economists also have an entire theory built upon the, um, the value of local information um, and, and the fact that nobody knows better than you how to do your job. And so we need to build systems that are able to uh, empower people to really have, um, have a say in, in what their, their work looks like. Um, so I think there's, there's interesting things when you can put together sort of people on the conservative end and on the, the more left end um, there. And then finally, some, some things about the big picture. Um, and so I, I kind of grouped these under the idea of embeddedness. So on one hand, there's no such thing as the free market. There's institutions, there's the state, there's language, culture, religion, and all of these things are, are the context in which market economies can operate. And it, it's not a coincidence that the things that we know now as market economies developed alongside of strong nation states, um, and that there, there really is a, an entire legal framework upon which the economy rests. Um, but then on the other side, looking outwards, the economy is, is, must balance ecological and social constraints because the economy is embedded in the Earth's larger um, biosphere and the larger ecology of the Earth. And so whatever we do within the economy, it must respect both the ecological limits but also the physical limits of the Earth. Um, and so there's a lot of interesting work about um, energy flows and, and um, sort of making sure the economy obeys the second law of thermodynamics. Um, and that's, that's kind of an entire research paradigm. So it's a lot of stuff, um, but, but I think that, that it's, it's helpful just to be able to connect back to some of the things that you're hopefully learning in the courses and the different lectures to see sort of a broader framework for, for how this fits together. Um, but one thing that I'm very excited about and, and I wanted to talk briefly about is this question of the output gap. So the very first one, I said, the economy is almost operating under full capacity. And so when I was in EPUG, I heard this from all of the professors and I kept thinking, but how far under capacity? Are we talking about 5%, 10%, 50%? I don't know. And they didn't really have clear answers. Um, so this is, this is work being done by my supervisor at Roma 3 that I think is quite interesting of trying to use um, unemployment data, and they're now actually looking at um, labor force participation rates and hours worked numbers, so it's kind of more than just the official unemployment rate, to give an estimate for how much productive capacity there is in the economy. Um, and so conceptually, the idea is if you were to be able to stimulate demand fully, how much growth could you expect before you started to hit inflationary pressures? Um, so the charts are pretty far away. But on, on this side, you have the green line, which is the official output gap estimate from the Congressional Budget Office for the US, which basically shows that the, the way that they calculate the output gap is as a moving average of how growth was in the past. So you look at your growth rate today and say, is this higher or lower than growth was in the last 20 years? If the growth is, is higher, then you're, you're over the, the output gap. If it's lower, then you have a negative output gap, um, which it's one way of doing things, but it's not what we talk about when we, it's not what we mean when we actually talk about an output gap. So the red line is their estimates looking at how much unemployment is there um, and what would the economy look like if it were to achieve 3.4% unemployment um, compared to, to previous uh, parts of the American economy or the path of the American economy. And so that's a totally different picture in which it is almost always negative, except for maybe two years in the 19, late 1960s. Um, and it, it bounces between five and 10%, meaning that in any given year, if we were to stimulate demand, you could expect five to 10% more growth in the US economy, which if you add that up year after year and say, okay, well, what if we had done that? What if we'd actually had a full demand path? You get the chart over here. Um, so the green line is a reflection of what this red line is over here, showing the gap in any given year. Um, and then the red line shows what would have happened if you had tried to follow the, the high demand path the entire time. And the growth is enormous. You're, you're talking about a 50% increase over, over the second half of the century for the US. Um, and when I was in EPUG, I would look at this and think, wow, that's incredible. Like, we could have been so much richer. This could have been great. We, what, a, what a horrible thing that we've missed all this growth. A couple of years later, I look at this and it's terrifying. It's, wow, we would have been totally screwed if we had done this from a climate perspective. And, and, and wow, isn't it great that we, we weren't able to <laughs> figure out our economy? Um, and so that's, that's really where I have ended up in trying to, to work with climate economy models. 
to, oh, 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 I'm going in circles. Yeah, working with climate economy models to try to see how, um, how this growth picture can kind of make that balance of like, yes, we could be much richer, but that would also put a lot more pressure on the economy. Okay, and it looks like I'm halfway through. That's, that's probably good. So climate economy models. We, I'm gonna try to talk pretty quickly about what this framework is. Um, so this is a, a type of modeling known as integrated assessment modeling. And so what these models are is, is any type of model that contains an economic module that is then linked to a climate module. So you have a, an economic model that tries to predict what's going to happen or project what's going to happen in the economy. And then you take those outputs and run them through a climate model, which tells you how much warming you would expect from that level of CO2. Um, that's the basic level, but you almost always have a lot more things added on top of them. So almost all of these have an energy component that tries to project how much energy is being created, what are the sources it's coming from, how is it distributed throughout the system. Um, and then you can, you can have lots of different things like land use. Um, someone's working on biodiversity, but that's kind of a, a, a new side of things. Um, basically everything from the physical sciences, uh, mineral use, material use, uh, I'm kind of blanking on, on how many different things get connected into here, uh, but we'll see in a second. Um, that all go into this one big model, and then you can change policy variables and see how it affects everything throughout the entire system. Um, and it's interesting for us because they use economic data both as an input to the model. So you tell the model what is your starting assumption of how much growth or, or economic activity you're expecting. And then it's an output of the model where you see what actually happens after you run it through the climate scenario. Um, and, and I think that it's helpful to think of this type of modeling as really more of a form of science fiction um, than, than any kind of hard predictions or, 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 um, or the kind of the modeling you might be familiar with of trying to project interest rates in the next six months. That's not what we're doing here. So we're really trying to tell a coherent story of the world's technical, social, economic, and environmental developments 100 years in the future, um, which it, it, it's an ambitious task, but it's sort of the mess that we've gotten ourselves into is that we do now need to think about these things in a, a very long-term view. Um, and so there's, there's sort of two sides of, of this, this problem or this, this type of modeling. One is the actual construction of the models itself. And so I like to think about this as, as closer to the world building. So you think about how do different things relate to each other? How do the pieces connect? Um, and then once you have built this world of, of how things operate, you can then try to tell stories in it. So you can say, let's tell a story where uh, nuclear energy becomes incredibly cheap. We have a huge breakthrough in fusion. Um, what does that look like for the rest of the, 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 the system? Or we tell a story in which, let's say that we're, we're unable to get a carbon tax through, um, but we try to do lots of industrial development uh, in, in different countries and have a regional approach. What does that look like? What are the problems? What, where, where does that system go? Um, and my, my basic critique, and I guess this is everyone's critique, is that we need both r more realistic worlds, so we need better models, but we also need to tell more interesting stories. Um, and we need to, to think of more relevant stories that we can tell with these models. Um, so very briefly, confusingly, there's two different types of models that use the, the name integrated assessment model. Um, one of them is the, the Nordhaus climate damages literature. Um, and that's that you may be familiar with that. I believe the discussants are going to talk a little bit about that, so I'm just going to jump past it. Um, but the other type and the one that I'm really working on or, or interested in are these emission pathway models. Uh, so these are the models that are the backbone of the economic parts of the IPCC reports. Um, so here we have the beautiful chart of all of the different scenarios that were included in the recent uh, report on 1.5 degrees warming. So you can see each line is a different path that the scenario projected for, for how we can achieve 1.5 degrees. Um, and these, are, these things are real science fiction thrillers. Um, so I don't think you can read a whole lot of that, but this was just sort of a, an example from one of these reports, um, which had 212 pages of tables and charts like this showing absolutely everything that the model predicted. So just to quickly see what's here, on one side, you have the amount of investments that are needed in different parts of the economy. Here you have the job creation from di in different sectors by region. Here you have the amount of, um, CO2 emissions, energy demand, fossil fuel use. 
Up here you have different technologies that are needed, how much wind power is there, how much storage, how much uh, electric vehicles. Over here we have a breakdown of how much blue hydrogen versus how much green hydrogen you have. Um, really it goes in as much detail and depth as you can possibly imagine. Um, and it's quite useful from a policy perspective to be able to have these results. So I have one model that can both simultaneously speak to the electric vehicle industry and the blue hydrogen industry uh, and labor groups who want to know what's happening with jobs uh, and central banks who want to know what's happening with investment. And it's all coming from my one big beautiful model. Um, uh -huh. I have to wake up my mouse every time. Yep. Uh, yeah, and so I think I'll have to go through this a little bit quickly, but, um, but every story and every, every scenario needs a starting point. Um, so in the early days of the IPCC reports, each model group just got to pick what its starting point was. So one would assume we're going to have 2% growth uh, if there's no climate change, and then we see what happens once we add climate change into the model. Um, and that made it very difficult to compare the results because you had just different baseline assumptions. So there's been a lot of interesting work in trying to create a set of shared baseline inputs that you can use to start your models. Uh, these are called the shared socioeconomic pathways. Um, and they're, they're, tri they're grouped around different stories. So these are stories of the potential path that the world could take uh, if there was no climate change. And then the act of modeling is to take this world, add climate change into it, and see what is the result. Um, so I won't go completely through how they build this, but basically there's five different ones. One of them is supposed to be the good road, so it's a, uh, a world in which sustainability is very easy, uh, taking the green road. You have a middle of the road that's kind of a blend of all of them. Regional rivalry is the rocky road where, where countries are not able to collaborate and you have an increasing inequality. Um, I guess you also have inequality um, in which the, the rich countries get richer and the poor countries don't, um, and that you, you again don't have a lot of cooperation. And then fossil fuel development, which is the most fun one, where we burn all of the coal and all of the oil on earth, we get incredibly rich doing so. Uh, climate change goes crazy, but it doesn't matter because we're so rich uh, that we can, we can deal with it. Um, and just because it's a room of economists, uh, I wanted to kind of just show what, what the actual GDP assumptions are in these, because once you get into it, it's a little bit crazy. Um, so the basic projection is that by the end, so here we have GDP per capita for the world, and then down here is the growth rates uh, for each of the five SSPs. Um, so the basic uh, headline is that the global economy will expand by five to 10%, or, sorry, by five to 10 times by the end of the century, um, which is a lot of growth. Uh, the average incomes in that taking the highway burn all of the coal scenario reach 140,000 uh, US dollars as the average globally, um, which is wildly high. Um, I mean, that would be a nice world, but it's quite ambitious. Um, and then, but even in the, the taking the green road SSP, uh, you still have about 2% growth every year globally until the 2060s. Um, so there really isn't any scenario that looks at any kind of negative growth or degrowth of any kind. Um, and, and just the last thing on these that, that is interesting because they have a lot of different projections here is what happens to inequality. Um, and so in this green line, which is the middle of the road, sort of baseline um, continuation of current trends, they project a decrease in inequality to the point that the world would be more equal by the end of the century than Denmark currently is today. Um, which again, it is possible, but that's quite ambitious in my mind. Um, whereas in, in some of the more ambitious scenarios, the Gini coefficient goes down to 0.2%, which means that there's basically no inequality at a global level. Um, but quite interestingly, even in the bad SSPs, where you do have the one literally named inequality, um, you don't have an increase in global inequality. It, it basically flatlines. Um, and so I, I, from a modeling perspective, it's interesting that there isn't really sort of a, a, a bad scenario here in terms of, I mean, it is possible that inequality increases in the world, right? Uh, and it seems like that's something that we should at least have some modeling tools for. Um, could I ask how much time I have? Okay. Um, so this is just a pretty model of what one of these uh, emissions pathway models looks like. Um, and again, we'll play with this a little bit later, so I won't go too far into it now. Um, but just to say that there's at least four major types of economic modeling used as the, the center of, this, of these big models. 
by far the most common are general equilibrium models. So these are either computable general equilibrium, dynamic stochastic general equilibrium, um, or some kind of partial equilibrium model um, in which you optimize one industry but then keep everything else, everything else uh, status quo. And so all of the models in the IPCC reports are, are using these general equilibrium models, um, and these are 100% based on neoclassical economics. Um, there's at least three other types of modeling that can be used. Uh, there's macroeconometric modeling, uh, which tries to have lots of different econometric uh, equations that all overlap on each other and create this massive picture of what the world would look like. The charts that I was showing earlier of all the different uh, outputs from one model was from a macroeconometric model. Um, and these, are, these can be quite nice because you can actually have um, fairly relaxed theoretical assumptions. So the, the guy working on one of the major ones of this says he's a post-Keynesian, um, and at least in like the like 30 to 40 year range, you're able to have quite serious growth effects. But because of the nature of the econometric modeling, over the long term, you have a return to the trend, just because that's what the, the econometric method does. It sort of brings you back to your coefficients. Um, so another type of modeling is system dynamics modeling. Um, this is basically having large, large set of algebraic equations that all interact with each other. With this, you are able to have fully post-Keynesian um, center of the model in which demand is the main leader. So this is actually a, a, a diagram of the Medeas model, which is a, a system dynamics model. Um, and the basic idea in this is that demand sets the level of economic activity if there is enough energy in the economy to meet the demand. So the main limit isn't necessarily supply generally, um, but it's how much energy there is. So that's kind of just a different way of, of thinking through that. And then finally, there's agent-based models now. Um, so I, I was saying, I, I wrote this paper at the beginning of the summer, and I had this line of, sadly, there's no agent-based models. And then at the end of the summer, I went to a conference, and someone was saying, oh, we've just created an agent-based model. So there's, there's some exciting things going on there. Um, and the main one that I know of is the Schumpeter Media Keynes model. Um, if anyone's familiar with Giovanni Dossi and some of the friends in Italy, um, they've now taken this model that's primarily an innovation economics model and tried to start adding climate change to it, which is, which is awesome. Very, very exciting things. Um, so I don't have a ton of time for the end here, but just to quickly, hmm, I might have to jump past this. Just to say the story that we're currently telling with these, these general equilibrium models, um, there's some, some very clear uh, trends that come out of this. So first is carbon taxes. Um, by far, the, the only way effectively that we are, are dealing with climate change is a universal carbon tax. So that's kind of the starting assumption. Um, and by imposing this carbon tax, you're able to drive the development of new technology. And so throughout the model, the technology gets cheaper and cheaper. So if you're building a windmill in 2070, it's way cheaper than building a windmill today, which makes the model want to build all the windmills when they're cheaper at the very end, um, which is kind of an issue. Um, there's fairly quick decarbonization. So around the um, 2050s, we reach net zero. Uh, but there's still some level of CO2 overshoot. Uh, and, and so you have to have major negative emissions. Uh, and this is pretty well baked into all of the, the models in the IPCC reports. You can kind of see the zero line here and all of the models go under it. So the assumption is that we have fairly major negative emissions for a long time. Um, and that this is possible because carbon capture gets very cheap and effective. Uh, it currently is neither of those things. Um, again, I can't tell you that it won't be, but I, I can at least tell you that we should model pathways in which it is not. Um, and, and there's massive economic costs to, to this, and I'll talk about that in a second. Um, and one just kind of crazy thing on all of this is these models don't actually include climate damages. Um, so the discussants will talk about the climate damage models, but these emission pathway models don't actually have a feedback in which the scenarios that have large amounts of warming then have large damages from climate change. So you're operating in a world in which you have all of the costs of preventing climate change, but none of the cost actually of climate change. So. They say they're working on that, and there's a new report coming out in 20, early 2022, and I really hope that they figured that one out, but it's, we'll see. So I'm just, I think I'm pretty much, yeah, I've got one minute, so I'm gonna take three minutes um, and, and go through just where we can go with this as heterodox economics, so putting the things together. Um, so I guess I haven't, if you read the paper, this is what the paper is all about. Um, 
the, in the general equilibrium models, as I was saying, because they're based on neoclassical economics, it is impossible for the models to have growth effects coming from increased investments. Um, so the way the model works is that it takes the amount of growth that was set by the shared socioeconomic pathway, um, so those the pretty growth lines, it then says that is the amount, the maximum amount of growth that can be achieved by the model, but because you're imposing carbon taxes, some slightly smaller amount of growth will be achieved by the model because you're shifting investments away from the most productive investments into these weird green things that, that can't be quite as productive or the market would have done them by itself. Um, and so what this chart is, is showing for a number, all of the models in the, the 2014 IPCC report, how much GDP losses you had from the mitigation or from stopping climate change within the model. And so it's by different years. Um, and the main thing just to see is here in 2100, oh, the other thing is each line is um, how much emissions there are. So on the right, the blue ones, those are the ones where you did a lot of mitigation and you did a really good job. The red ones are the ones where you didn't do as much. Um, and so of course, the more mitigation you do, the more the costs are. Um, but just for like a range of scale, uh, sort of the 50% line here for 2100 in which we actually fight climate change is that it'll cost about 6% of GDP, but as high as 12% um, as how much less the end point GDP would be in if we had not had to do all of this. So keep that range in mind of 6 to 12% um, of the, the cost of fighting climate change when we hear about the climate damage models um, because there's a big disconnect there. Um, so, so yeah, what does this mean for us? What does this mean for ecological economics and post-Keynesian economics and all of this world? Um, and there's kind of a weird trick here going on because on one hand, mitigating climate change will be economically much easier to finance than our models have suggested if the post-Keynesians are right. Because instead of costing 12% of GDP, you're gonna have all this new investment. You're probably going to have a huge boom in GDP. Um, and so if you're trying to sell this to policymakers, instead of saying this is gonna be a huge cost you have to pay, you can say, really, you're gonna get rich because your economy is operating at such a low level of capacity. Um, the problem, of course, is that the task of mitigating climate change will also be larger than we expect. Because if you do have this growth, it'll filter through the economy and you won't just be building solar panels, but all of the other things in the economy which are not decarbonized. Um, and so it's something that we have to plan for. We have to know if you're going to have these massive investments that there's going to be economic effects and that you're going to need more investments than you originally thought. Um, and so that's, that's kind of the trick. Um, and, and I think this was sort of the starting point conceptually, but then the, the modeling framework was quite useful for trying to see, okay, but how do you put all of this together into a model? Um, so that's what I've done the first year of the PhD. I'm right now at the, the end of the first year, um, is thinking about this question. The two things that I kind of want to focus on for the rest of the PhD is this question of the, the speed of the transition. So the models that I showed you are cost optimization models. So what they're doing is showing you the cheapest possible way to get to your target. What is the cheapest way to get to 1.5 degrees warming? And surprise, it's to wait until the end of the century and then build lots of carbon capture because we just think it's going to be cheap. Um, and so. What if you don't have that as the starting point, but say, instead, I want the fastest decarbonization possible without overshooting certain ecological and social economic boundaries. So saying there's, there's a target unemployment rate that I don't want massive unemployment, I don't want incomes to crash, um, and I don't want to, to hurt other parts of the biosphere. How fast can we go? What can we do? Um, and, and I think the donut, the donut model can be kind of an interesting starting point there just for having a list of the different things that you don't want to violate and then trying to put that into a more formal modeling framework to say, okay, what, if, what are the different scenarios and what are the trade-offs? Um, what, are, what are sort of the possibilities there? Um, and then finally, I, I think it's just very, one of the main contributions of heterodox economics is to expand the vision of what is possible for the economy. So neoclassical economics has some very useful tools for maximizing the efficiency of the economy we already have, 
but it is not particularly useful for dreaming up new types of economies and new economic systems. And, and I think the thing that's becoming very clear is that whatever is coming with climate change, things are going to change. Um, and that's something we should be prepared for. And so I think this type of modeling can be very useful to take whatever it is that we're working on, whether we're thinking about cooperatives and local organization or thinking about large state-driven industrial policy and think, okay, how can this fit into this climate economy framework? What are the climate impacts of this? Um, and so both on the good side, of course, that we could, we could have a much better, more prosperous economy, but also on the bad side, we could really have breakdown of basic social norms and law and you can have countries disappearing and it's something that as modelers and as academics we should be starting to show those scenarios and show what does that look like so we're prepared to at least start taking steps now to, to avoid the worst ones. Um, so maybe that wasn't the happiest note to end on but I'll be back and we're going to play some games with this kind of modeling. Uh, so thank you everybody and hopefully I'll see you guys on a Greek island somewhere. But. <laughs>
you calculate the costs from, uh, from the impact of climate change in given sectors, so how uh, the produce, how producers will be affected, how consumers. Uh, we have this statistical econometric um, that we already know, so you understand how variations of income uh, across space or time will be uh, affected in a given amount of time. And this is very interesting. We have this model proposed uh, in Wallace. Um, I'll, gi I'll catch my note. And it's very interesting because they try to uh, use a kind of uh, twisted logic. They try to understand how a decrease of four degrees uh, in the temperature of global temperature will uh, affect uh, would affect uh, different economies and the conclusion that they have it's very interesting our work has proved by absurd the strong limitations of statistically based methods to quantitatively assess future economic damage so our model is awful and you cannot use this also to use in the in the different um, uh, increase of uh, temperature. So it's it's very uh, very optimistic to understand that this is not a, a catastrophe cat catastrophe in the world. And one of these more classical uh, models it's using the uh, IMF working paper on economic damage assessment. So you have a global estimation of 174 countries, uh, a lot of generalizing assumptions. Uh, they understand that, uh, here. I don't know if you can see this, but there is this red part that uh, is uh, hot, uh, hot countries that are mostly developing countries, and the blue uh, are cold and rich countries. And the three interesting thing is that, um, it's not expected that rich countries will be really affected by this because they are colder. And the economic activity is um, made mostly indoors with air conditioning and radiators. So it's not that important. Um, so now we, I pass to you. Yes. Thank you. So yeah, just to summarize what Caro uh, have just said. These models, as we say, are in a sense uh, all theory that is dying. Firstly, because they have, as Keen pointed out, several data problems, which he argues basically they are trying to make up numbers to justify what they believe uh, um, they already believe before making these models because they don't uh, include, for example, uh, turning points or climate catastrophes. And they also, as Caro mentioned, have unrealistic assumptions. Most of the activities, economic activities, are not included in these estimations because they are simply done indoors. So that's why most of the effects of climate change would not affect GDP. And this could be summarized by a Twitter exchange because uh, between um, heterodox economies asking uh, neoclassical economies, so are you actually suggesting that uh, the uh, 10 degrees rise in global average surface temperature will be manageable? and he answers, well, we just move indoors, much like the Saudis have. This is the degree of this connection with the climate change uh, problem, and it has two important um, political, let's say, consequences. And the first, or on the one hand, they, as uh, in the case of North House that win a Nobel Prize, they are gatekeepers. They have the power to say, okay, this paper is scientific, this paper is not so scientific. So they have the power to avoid us criticizing this knowledge, avoid criticizing the data problems, the unrealistic assumptions, and in a sense to tell a different story. But also, as Caro mentioned, they have influence in a political level. They are able, or this story that they are telling, influence how we are going to manage to face and approach and address the ecological um, emergency or crisis. That is why we want to tell you two stories that are important for us to challenge this, um, let's say, old or more known history. The first one is a heterodox story, what we call the post-Kinesian ecological super multiplier. <sighs> J. Christopher talked about Serafians. Uh, we are not going to go deep in this, but <laughs> we already know that GDP will inevitably fall, either because we manage to make the GDP go down or because we face ecological crisis. So post-Kinesian asks, 
can we do this? Can this happen in a socially and environmentally sustainable way? And the answer is yes. Montserrat in 2019 found with another model, a new story, that there is a possibility of a stable equilibrium with a negative rate of growth. How? It's Raffian theory, the paper is really complicated, really sophisticated, we can share it later. But basically by taming animal spirits through autonomous consumption. By decreasing autonomous consumption, we can make a negative rate of growth and a stable equilibrium. And as we learned in several joint seminars or even the ecological courses, diminution of aggregate consumption does not translate into the loss of well-being. So actually, the post uh are uh, able to tell a story that is both a degrowth story and a well-being story, with uh, including in the model things like working time reduction, uh, tax justice, etc. This is a really beautiful and powerful story, but um, two weeks ago in Musée d'Orsay, we saw this picture and we thought on the one hand, okay, we are facing the same story. We are all facing a coming storm. But when we look downwards, we realize that we are not in the same boat. And that is why we need a history built from the margins, built from the periphery. What do I mean by this? That most stories, post Canadian histories, uh, stories, sorry, are really powerful, really sophisticated, but most of the time forget open economy issues. That is, Ula. We have, on the one hand, a technologically advanced industrial center, thank you, and a lagging periphery. When they trade, because of this uh, asymmetry, productive asymmetry, the center is able to shift away the more distracted part of the production to the periphery. What in this paper they call the ecologically unequal exchange. In this sense, we have to think that every successful decoupling experience in the center is linked to outsourcing pollution to poorer countries. In a continue, continuing with the metaphor from the boat, the boat that has the most capabilities to face the ecological crisis is shifting the load to the boat that is more fragile. That is why we have to take into account that yes, we are in the same storm and therefore we need coordination between the center and the periphery to avoid global rebound effects. But also, we are in different boats. The boats are different. So we are facing different responsibilities when tackling the ecological crisis. And this is really key if you want to tell a global and coherent story. So that being said, we move to the questions if you want to make yours. Yeah, so uh, the first question that we had, uh, it's uh, the tasks that are being uh, held for heterodox theory. Uh, one of the things that uh, I saw in one of the papers that I read, it was uh, talking about more uh, working more uh, regionally, like in small locus of space and time to understand more of economic damage and how this also can connect uh, us more like economists with the natural sciences. If we are like uh, trying to understand economic damage, we need to uh, work also with people that are working in the natural sciences and they are really understanding different things that we cannot see. So how, uh, what are the tasks for heterodox uh, theory to, to work more closely with natural science, for example? Um, uh, my question is more related to your insight that I think is very powerful about models being a uh, type of storytelling. If we now use models as a narrative technology and we are able to graph different stories or different chapters of the same story, do you think that we need now to supplement models with these different chapters or we need to um, embrace the idea that the history or the story that we want to tell is too complex and we need to find another narrative technology? Um, I think that's all. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, so <laughs> casual questions there. <laughs> Uh, that sounds like more of a question for, for the entire movement. Um, but I guess maybe just first a couple of reactions on, on, on the presentation. 
or specific things. So one, one detail on the Ice Age model, I'm sort of saying, okay, if we take, we take the climate models we have and run the last Ice Age through them, what would it say? That pretty chart of like, it's very bad for some places, but very good for other places. It actually had a positive effect on GDP of 36% was the main output um, because as, as Carol was saying, you end up with much, um, much more growth in Africa and, and Southeast Asia. And so actually returning to the ice age from a global perspective would be much, much better uh, than having no climate change at all. So those are the kind of models that we're playing with. Um, and then uh, so similarly, uh, Nordhaus, who was one of the main developers of these, won the Nobel Prize a few years ago. At the time he won the Nobel Prize, he, he was saying that the, the optimal target for how much warming we should be trying to achieve was about four degrees, um, which is now both looking like it would be close to the end of the world, but also looking like it would be very difficult for us to even hit that level uh, because you would have to burn a large amount of coal that would be more expensive than renewable energy. You would kind of have to go out of your way to even hit four degrees. So that's sort of both how quickly things can change, but also how crazy that is. And then the guy that you had on Twitter there, Richard Toll, uh, he was actually the lead author for the IPCC's adaption section, um, sort of the big working group on adaption. And so, uh, yeah, the gatekeeping thing is super real. I mean, the, the guy who is writing the IPCC report trying to tell us how we're gonna deal with climate change thinks 10 degrees will be just fine because you go indoors. Oh boy, okay. There's lots of very serious people working on lots of very serious models, but you only need a couple at the top who can cut everything else off and have a big problem. So again, not really my job to, to fix that today, but it's a good thing to keep in mind for, for our careers and what we're doing. Um, for the actual questions, um, tasks for heterodox theory, transdisciplinary story. So I think this is why I have been drawn so much to this type of modeling. Um, so I didn't talk a lot about the actual structure of how these are created, like organizationally. Um, usually you have very large groups uh, based at like 12 different universities. Uh, a lot of these are sort of big funding projects all together. And so you'll have the biologist in one place, the economist in one place, the physicist in another place. Um, and then they all work on their parts of the model and then they all try to bring them together. Um, and so there's maybe 20 major models um, that are, are kind of at this really big global level and have dozens of people working on them. Uh, and there's at least this one Medeus model, which is quite heterodox um, and is really post-Keynesian and ecological people working together. But I think that that's just such a great way forward for us because I, I really hope that, I think that we have a lot more possibility to speak to natural scientists who are able to look at what the orthodox or neoclassical economists say and say, wow, that's insane. Um, and then we can have something else that we can offer that can be a little less insane. Um, so I, I think that there is, there's room for us there. Part of the issue like career wise is that you're working on a giant project with lots of people um, and that can be difficult, especially if you're doing a PhD or a master's thesis um, and that you, you need kind of a lot of time to get into these, these networks. Um, but, but I think it is a good thing to think about now while you're still doing master's theses because if you can get into these systems and sort of get into the, this type of modeling, you can really have a nice place for yourself where you can kind of be a part of something. So I don't know. It's something that I sort of wish looking backwards if I had been at the beginning of one of these models as opposed to trying to come in five years after it had been developed, um, it could have been a lot easier. Um, so, and then I think specifically on like what we're doing, I just, I just have this great vision that all the cool things that we have to say as heterodox economists have somewhere that they can live in this type of modeling. Um, and again, there's huge barriers of entry of trying to come in and like learn the model to bin, then be able to modify it and, and work on it. So it's, it's a huge project and you have to start early and you have to really like be, be a part of it. But that's kind of why I'm hopeful that as EPOG, we can start talking about this and thinking about this and, and use our connections and our networks. Um, so then on the, the question of the narrative technology, I quite like that phrase. Um, I, th I had a question, I gave a seminar at the UTC um, research lab yesterday and, and one of the questions was 
sort of these models are, are fun. They're nice for policy reasons. Like I see why politicians like them, but like academically, is this is this real? Like is this kind of like a joke at some point? Um, and, and I think yes, academically there is value here. There is some interesting insights to be gained. But like you do have to acknowledge that when you have so many balls moving in the air at the same time, the amount of descriptiveness that you can have for any one of them is, is limited. Um, but you really can't undersell the political value of these things. Um, this is how countries make decisions. You need to have one of these big massive models that can say, if we do this, we will achieve our Paris goals. Um, and if you don't have that, then then what? We're, we're sort of, we're using our smaller models trying to make more specific points, which again is incredibly useful, but we're not using the language that is currently being asked for, or the language that is currently being used by the people who are making these decisions. Um, I think there's also like a whole discussion about whether us using the right language and telling better stories is enough. Of course, you need changes in power, you need different relations, but I think that there is something important to say about are we ready for when those changes in power come? So let's say we suddenly have President Bernie Sanders in the US and you have progressives get elected all across Europe. What do we tell them? And do we have the kind of models that they would be comfortable and familiar with and able to really get through the systems? So kind of a very long answer, but, but I, I think that it's good to both be clear eyed and, and aware of the limitations of, of what kind of like crazy fantasy models these are, but also understand the necessity for, for having these kind of models. Um, I think that's all I've got, um, but maybe we can have a couple questions and then we can do some other stuff.